turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. We're going right back to where we were last week. Last week, we started a series called Counterfeits, Cheap Substitutes for Eternal Treasures. The things that Satan will convince us are worthy trade-offs for what God already has for us. And so last week, we talked about money from this passage and how one of the deadliest counterfeits that Satan has for us is money and how the love of money is a, a blinding type of temptation. It makes us not want to ask difficult questions. It doesn't, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't come obviously like some of the other sins. Lust is a very obvious sin. Anger, wrath is a very obvious sin. Greed is a very non-obvious sin. You can have it and not even know that you have it makes you not want to ask questions like, should I really buy this? Do I really need to keep working this life-sucking job? Should I really be spending this much money on this? We don't even want to ask those questions because greed can blind us to the fact that we are actually greedy. But we also read you cannot have both God as master and money as master. You can't love and serve both at the same time. It doesn't work. A lot of Americans are trying to ride that line, sit on that fence and say, I do love God and I also love my money. It doesn't work that way. Jesus says you love one and you despise the other. So if you love your money, you despise God. You can't have it any other way. So we need to ask God to reveal our true hearts. Do we really love him and serve him or are we really loving and serving money? Money's like a fire. It has the power to be used for incredible good. If it's managed, guarded, and cared for, but if it gets out of control, it'll burn your house down and it will kill you. And so we read in Matthew chapter 6 the prescription. The prescription for this cancer inside of us that we call the love of money is not to continue hiding behind our shallow religious objections to giving, but rather to obey God and to give freely, to give sacrificially, to give until there's nothing left to give, and to trust that God will be our provider, our protector, and our defender. So today we're going to stay right here in this passage, and we're going to talk about another dangerous counterfeit that steals eternal treasures from us. So go with me, Matthew chapter 6, we'll start in verse 1. The Word of God says, "'Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them.'" Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly." And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Skip down to verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do not lay up treasures for yourselves on the earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The counterfeit we're talking about today is the counterfeit of religion. Now remember, everything that God creates, we talked about this last week, everything God creates, Satan counterfeits. And so God creates humans. He creates the expression of human worship. 
teaching, singing, prayer, sacraments, all of these things God has created to give us a way to express our worship of him. And religion, all that is, all that word means is just a ordering of those things. It's a system of ordering all of those elements so that we know what belongs and what doesn't belong. So, for instance, a false religion will put anything but God at the center of their worship. Muslims worship a different God, so their religion is false. Mormons worship a different Jesus, so their religion is false. Hindus and Buddhists don't worship the creator God, so their worship is false. And church people have a false worship too. It happens when they place themselves at the center of worship instead of God. We're worshiping something different at that point. So Satan has counterfeited God's perfect religion simply by redirecting the object of our worship away from God and to ourselves. So God is no longer the one being worshiped. It's us that's being worshiped. I'm the center of worship. And this is exactly what was going on among the worshipers of God when Jesus comes on the scene. The most spiritual people of that day the ones who should be leading the people in the right worship of God have made religion all about themselves. Now listen to this. Religion is deadly when it becomes self-serving. It is deadly when it becomes self-serving. So today we're going to look at three ways that the Pharisees were self-serving in their religion, how they made it about them. First of all, Matthew 6 tells us they did self-serving good deeds, they had self-serving prayer and fasting, self-serving giving. By the way, we have these sermon notes on the back table. You will not offend me if you get up and go grab one. If you want to follow along, it's helpful, and also it's great to be able to take it home with you and be able to reference some of these main points that we're talking about. Um, so those, those three things, we'll come back to them, but they'll be on your notes as well. So self-serving good deeds. Let's go ahead and look back at Matthew 6 and see what Jesus says about self-serving good deeds. He says, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed... Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Now, I'm reading this passage this week, and I, I instantly go, wait a minute, we have a problem here. Because Jesus says, don't do good works out in the open. Do it in secret. But Jesus and his apostles did good deeds publicly, out in the open, all the time. In fact, often just to make a point, Jesus would do a good deed publicly. Think about when he would heal on the Sabbath. He often did it on the Sabbath for a reason in a place where he would be seen by the people who would take offense to it because he's trying to make a point. And so what gives? Here he says, don't do good deeds in public. But there's another problem here because one of the primary ways that we as the church let people know that we're disciples of Christ is by the way we act in public. If we're never supposed to do good in public, how will people know that we follow Jesus? How will they be drawn to him? If the church does all of our good deeds secretly and nobody ever knows that we're the ones doing the good deeds, won't they think the church doesn't care about the community because they never see us do anything? So we have a problem here, but there's a very important phrase that you can't miss, and it's going to unlock Jesus' meaning for us. It says, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men in publicly to be seen by them. Yes, Jesus did good works in public, but he didn't perform good deeds in public to be seen by men. He did good deeds in public because Jesus loved people. It wasn't for praise. It wasn't for a pat on the back. It was because he loved people. He wasn't trying to be a celebrity. In fact, if you read through the Gospels, you'll see many times when Jesus would heal someone and say, don't tell anybody that I healed you because he knew if he became a celebrity, he wouldn't be able to go anywhere. People would flock around him all the time. He would be less effective if people knew that he was in town and that he was healing people. And so he, he was trying very hard not to become a celebrity. 
He just loved people. So the Pharisees, they did their good deeds for the approval of men. Jesus did his good deeds for the approval of the Father. And that makes all the difference in the world. Because if you're doing your good deeds publicly or privately, this is what really matters. Are you doing it for the approval of men so that they'll like you, they'll respect you, they'll think that you're a good person? Or are you just doing it for the approval of the Father and it happened to be in public? See, Jesus was looking for an eternal treasure. He was looking for a lasting reward. But the Pharisees have their reward. And it's a cheap substitute. It's a cheap substitute for what? What are the Pharisees giving up? What are they trading in order to receive the praise of men? Well, they're trading the praise of God. They're trading the approval of God. Now, we all want the approval of God, right? We all want to get to the judgment in the final day and hear him say, well done, right? We want to be approved by God. Now, the Pharisees have their reward already, which means they don't get a divine well done. They don't get one. When they get to the final judgment, they won't hear well done from God. All they get is a well done from men. That's all they get. And when they get to the judgment, the approval of men is not going to do them any good. They won't be able to stand before the judge of the earth and say, all men love me and respect me. It doesn't hold any weight. See, the final judgment isn't a jury trial. You don't get a jury of your peers saying, I vouch for that one. No, there's no appealing to a higher court. If the judge doesn't approve of you, it's over. If you don't hear a well done from his mouth, it's over for you. Now, we as humans, we spend our entire lives seeking approval. We are built that way. We are built to want to seek approval. We want to hear well done so bad that we will take it from anywhere we can get it. But ultimately, we're looking for an eternal well done. So how sad would it be to realize that you heard well done all your life but when it comes time for the determination that really matters, there's no well done left for you. The one that determines your eternal destiny, you got well done from everybody else. But the one that really matters, there's no well done. You looked for it your whole life and you settled for a cheap substitute. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did and it cost them their souls. So if you seek the praise of men, your reward is now. There's no future reward coming. There's nothing else left. This is all you get. But if you seek the praise of God, you get it now and later. Remember Ephesians 1.14 says the Holy Spirit is given to us as a down payment, as a guarantee of what's to come. You get God now and forever. Right? The greatest portion of your reward is still to come, but there are benefits that you get to enjoy now. You have treasure in heaven, a divine well done waiting for you on the lips of your father. He's waiting to take you up in his arms and whisper to you, well done, child. Oh, my good, faithful servant, come in, come in. Welcome to the joy of your Lord. And then every day of your life, you get to hear that as well. You get to hear him whisper into your soul, keep going, keep going. You're doing good. Well done. It's coming. The final well done is coming. Oh, don't settle for a cheap substitute. Don't give up that eternal treasure because you want to hear well done from somebody else. Don't do it. The Pharisees also had self-serving prayer and fasting. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. There it is again. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Moreover, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Pharisees wanted attention. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be noticed. Kind of reminds me of my kids. Anytime they do anything, 
they draw me a picture or they build something with blocks or for right now Arrow is putting together little superheroes and he calls it a scene that he makes. Anytime they do anything like that, they want to show you. They're so excited to get your approval, to get you to come and say, that's awesome. I love that. They want attention. They want to be validated. And this is built into all of us. We want people to see what we've done and to approve of us and to appreciate us. We all want to be liked and respected. But here's the problem. Jesus said the worship of God is no place to draw attention to yourself. If you draw attention to yourself when you should be worshiping God, it is of no benefit to you. You have your reward already. Now, see, here's what the Pharisees would do. They would go find a busy two-way street kind of at rush hour, and they'd be walking along, and then all of a sudden, as if compelled by some holy ambition that they could not refuse, they would stop right where they are, and they would just start praying. Like they couldn't take another step. They couldn't make it to the synagogue. They had to pray right now. They were compelled to pray, and they would just stop right. It just so happened they were in the median of a busy street, but they would stop right there, and they would lift their arms up, and they would shout to the top of their lungs, and they would pray And we see an example of this in Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke 18. It says, the Pharisee stood and prayed, God, I thank you I'm not like other men. They're extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I tithe of everything that I own. And the tax collector, standing afar off, just beat his breast wouldn't so much raise his eyes to heaven, but he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. See, one man had religion. The other man was worshiping. The tax collector came face to face with a holy God, and he knew his place. And there was humility there, and he found mercy in his humility. But the Pharisee was deceived into thinking that somehow he could gain favor with God by religiously exalting himself. He did not understand his place, and so he found no mercy. See, when the Pharisees fasted, they made sure that everybody knew they were being holy that day. They would go to great pains to make sure people knew they were uncomfortable. They were sacrificing for God. They wanted to get attention. So Jesus' solution to this is simple. Pray and fast to honor God, not yourself. Don't draw attention to yourself with loud, boisterous words, incessant repetition, eloquent, impressive language. Don't even let people know you're fasting when you are. Take a bath. Wear a smile. Act normal. The point of prayer and fasting is to honor God, not yourself. If you want to be rewarded, don't make it about you. The problem with the Pharisees' prayer is they didn't love prayer for itself. They loved prayer because of the way it would make men go, ooh, that man really knows how to pray. God must really listen to him. You know somebody like that? Every time they pray, it's like they're trying to make a big deal out of it, let you know exactly how good they are at praying. I can say that because I used to be one of those guys, and sometimes I still struggle with that. Sometimes I will intentionally try to not pray in an intelligent way just because I know that that's my tendency, to want to draw attention to myself. If you listen to me pray now, and I'm not holding myself up as an example because I'm telling you I struggle with this. I struggle with pride in prayer Because I grew up in a pastor's home. I know the right words to say. I know how to pray a prayer that will make you go, wow. But the problem is when you pray that way, your prayers don't get through. The reward is now. And so now when I pray, I try to take great pains to humble myself in my own eyes. I try to pray in a way that lets me know uh, I'm not big stuff right? Because I don't want my reward to be now. There's another danger here in praying and fasting. You can pray and fast in secret and still be self-serving. You can. 
If the reason you pray and fast is for self-approval, you're still seeking the praise of men. You're just seeking it from yourself. If it makes you feel better about yourself, or if you're prideful in your comparison of yourself with other people, if you fast and pray and think, I must be pretty holy, you're lying to yourself. You have your reward already. So now the fact that Jesus denounces the way the Pharisees prayed and fasted in public, by the way, is not a denouncement of all public prayers, right? Jesus prayed in public. He teaches us to pray, our Father in heaven, pray together. In the early church, in Acts chapter 1, we read how 120 of them were gathered together and they were all praying together. Praying together is essential to the Christian life. We should gather together to pray. I'd love to see prayer gatherings just popping up all over our church. You guys just getting together every day of the week and just praying. It doesn't have to be a church function. Just gather together and pray every day. I'd love to see that happen. But the point is, when we gather to pray, the focus has to be on Christ and our humility and desperation before him. It has to be on our inadequacy to put into words the true desires of our heart on our dependence of the Holy Spirit interpreting for us and Jesus interceding for us. That's the focus of our prayer. May it never be about us. Don't say your prayers. Pray your prayers from your heart. Pray your prayers. Finally, self-serving giving. Oh, great. We're back on money again. Well, go back and listen to last week because now we know your heart, right? Self-serving giving is another way that religion cheats us out of eternal treasures. So we're going to talk about a different side of giving, maybe one you've never considered. Last week we talked about how money is one of the biggest counterfeits that Satan uses to cheat us out of eternal treasures. And the solution that Jesus offers is give it away, lay up treasures in heaven. Here's the problem, though. There's a problem there. The Pharisees gave. They gave to the church. They gave liberally. Let me show you. Right here, Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. The the Pharisees were even tithing on their spices. They were tithing on everything. Look at Luke 18. We just read the Pharisee was bragging in his prayer, I tithe of everything that I possess. They did it. They tithed. Now in the same chapter, Luke 18, listen to this interaction that Jesus has with a rich young ruler. Now a certain ruler asked him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one and that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. The rich young ruler replies back, All these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Now, wait a minute, Jesus. That wasn't part of the deal. If I keep the commandments and obey the law and give to the church, that's supposed to be the deal. That was the covenant. You give the law, God gives the law, I keep the law. That was the covenant. Now, we don't know whether this man was a Pharisee or a church ruler or a government ruler, but it's most likely that he was a Pharisee, a high up, a leader. And so he would have been a law-keeping Pharisee. They all were. They were law keepers. That meant he tithed. So that's good enough, right? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to tithe, right? According to Jesus, that's not enough. He tells this rich young ruler he must sell everything he has and give it to the poor, and then he would be able to come follow Jesus. Now notice, Jesus didn't say, come follow me. He didn't even say, leave your stuff behind and come follow me. No, he made it very specific. Go sell it and give it to the poor. Now remember, this is a question of how to be saved. The question that was asked to Jesus is, how do I inherit eternal life? How do I get saved? This rich young ruler asked Jesus how he could have 
the one thing that his money could not buy him, eternal life. And so he had the good sense to recognize he needed eternal life, and he had the good sense to go and ask the one who could give him eternal life. So what gives Jesus? Why are you making it so hard on this man to get saved? Why not just believe in me and you will have eternal life, right? Does Jesus not know John 3.16? It feels unfair, doesn't it? Almost like Jesus just made up a rule for how to get into heaven just for this guy. And then he sends him home, sorrowful. The guy's sad because he knows he just passed up on eternal life. What's the point, Jesus? Why? Why are you doing this? Here's the point. If you don't want Christ now, you won't get Christ in eternity. If you don't want him now, you don't get him later. The rich young ruler loved his money. He loved his status. He loved his reputation. He kept the law and he tithed, but he didn't love Jesus and he didn't love the poor. See, this is important. Make sure you get this. Giving to the church does not guarantee you treasure in heaven. Giving to the church does not guarantee you a treasure in heaven. First of all, let me tell you what happens when you give to the church. You're helping to pay your pastors, which is biblical. It's commanded in the Bible, don't muzzle the ox when he treads out the corn. A workman's worthy of his wages. An elder who rules well is worthy of double honor. Scripture's full of commands to pay your pastor. But you're also paying to have music and lights and air conditioning and seats and a comfortable environment to worship in. You're paying for training and teaching aids for your kids and for yourselves. All of these things directly benefit you. You're investing in yourself. It's for your own spiritual development when you give to the church. And you should do that. There's very few better ways you can invest your money than by giving it to the church for your own spiritual development. But the tithe has always been to support the work of the church or the temple, which directly benefits you as the worshiper. A small portion of that tithe actually goes to the poor. Now, here at this church, we have missions giving and we have benevolence. It's a percentage of our budget. We'd love to give more, but even if we did, it would always be a percentage of the budget because the rest of the budget goes to do all those other things that I just mentioned for your spiritual development. Jesus says repeatedly, the way you lay up treasure in heaven is giving to the poor, not to yourself, not to the church, to the poor. That means more than your tithe, above the tithe. You should be giving to the poor, not just through the church. Do it on your own. Give to missions organizations that you trust to help the poor. Give to local organizations that work with the poor. Go give your time and resources in your area to help the poor. Now, we often try to rationalize away that command to give to the poor because, especially in America, there's so many people that abuse the system and pretend to be poor that aren't actually poor. But just because it's hard to give to the poor doesn't mean you don't have to do it. The command to give to the poor is not easy. It will take work. It will take sacrifice. But also he said, sell what you have and give it to the poor. When's the last time you sold something so that you would have more money to give to the poor? That's not how it works. No, no, no. We don't sell to give. We sell to upgrade. Right? You sell something so you have more money to buy something that's more expensive. That's the, way, the reason you sell things. But what if you sold things to downgrade and then give the rest away? Then you'd have treasure in heaven. That suggestion makes you a little sick to your stomach, doesn't it? It did me when I first wrote it down because we love our convenient, easy religion that says give your 10% if you can afford it and you're covered. We don't like so much Jesus saying rethink everything about the way you live your life. This is not a checklist that you have to fill out. This is a heart issue. You love your money. You love the praise of men. You love the attention that you can get. You love the good feelings that you get from doing good things. You love your religion more than you love Jesus. See, giving can be self-serving too. Giving in and of itself is not enough. You can give for the wrong reasons, just like we talked about last week, thinking it obligates God to make you wealthy 
Or you can give faithfully to things that benefit you. But until you give sacrificially, until you give with no chance of return to yourself, you have your reward already. Luke 14, verse 12. Then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. The poor can't repay you. That's exactly why you should give to them. It isn't self-serving to give to the poor. It is actually giving. David Livingstone, a famous missionary, gave his life to serve Christ by exploring Africa in order to create access to the gospel. He discovered and he named the Victoria Falls, which I've been to. It's a fantastic location. He was the one that discovered that. He spent his entire life passionately trying to abolish the African slave trade and then again going and making avenues for the gospel all over Africa. He started a lot of great mission work. And in an address to students at Cambridge University, his address was about leaving the benefits of England behind. In other words, forsaking a Western lifestyle of comfort. And he said, For my own part, I have never ceased to rejoice that God has appointed me to such an office. People talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward and healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with such a word in such a view and with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then with the foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these things are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. I never made a sacrifice. What a perspective. We should live sacrificially, but it should only look like a sacrifice to the people that are looking on who can't understand how we could live that way. To us, it should seem as no sacrifice at all. How can this be? How could we forsake such comforts of life here and still say, I never made a sacrifice? Look back at the ending of the story of the rich young ruler in Luke 18. It says this, and when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And then those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Now look at what Peter says. This is so fascinating to me. Peter said, see, Jesus, we've left all and followed you. So he said to them, I sh Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. So Peter's like, Jesus, hey, whoa, 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 we left everything. Look at this great sacrifice we made for you, Jesus. What do we get? Jesus says, Peter, you don't realize you're making no sacrifice at all. You still have a little love for the world in you, Peter. No man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom, Peter. I came to give you life more abundantly, Peter. Tell me again, what sacrifice are you making? See, Jesus made the sacrifice. He left everything. And he gave of himself fully and completely to make every sacrifice that you would make in his name as though it were no sacrifice at all. See, this is the key to true religion instead of counterfeit religion. It's a love for God that causes you to give of yourself everything. False religion calls you to gratify yourself. 
to heap praise and glory to your name. But pure religion is visiting the widows and orphans in their affliction. James 1.27. True religion is often thankless by men. True religion often brings persecution by men. You may not be well liked. You may not be well respected. You may not even feel like you're doing a good job, but you will have Christ now and forever. There is no sacrifice there. When we take the least notice of our good deeds, God pays the most attention. When others ignore you, God is keeping a record. He loves to reward. He loves to shower eternal treasures on his children. Hebrews 11.6, he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He wants to reward you. He doesn't want to withhold the reward from you. Satan wants to withhold the reward from you. That's why he promises you a reward now, a cheap substitute. He wants you to miss out on what's coming. But God so wants to reward you. It's coming. It's far greater than anything you could imagine. So just hold on. Don't let yourself be cheated by a cheap counterfeit. Hold on today.